It's not going to say anything, so I'm going to say something. Do you want to say something? Uh, thanks, George, and here's Chris. Okay. <laughs> wow, that was a good introduction there. So uh, George gets to go to Tajikistan, and I get to go to places like Ubli. So I guess it's a, it's a fair trade-off, I guess. So I'm going to talk about Western Bean Cutworms today. Uh, stop me as we go along if you have any questions. And uh, I have a lot of pictures, but it's so light in here. Mark is going to try to turn off one more set of lights, but I don't, I don't know if it's going to help. No, and that's on, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> off. There you go. Do one more set, see what happens. Okay. So right now, uh, the Western Bean Cutworms are sleeping underground. Oh, Martin, I forgot to get my Western Bean Cutworms out. If you go to my, look way in the back of the room in the bag, I, I like to order him around. There's a green bag under the coats there. See the green bag under the coats? Open that up. Okay, there's nothing bad in there. It's not, I'm not carrying drugs or anything. And take out the little, uh, the little box. I have a box of Western bean cutworms in there. See, I was like eating cookies in the back and I should have been doing something here. Mark is going to be my hand model today. And I have some of these little chambers to show you. Let's open it up. Here, give Tom a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep talking. You're, you're entertaining. Okay. Sorry, we're having trouble. <laughs> okay, so when, you, when I pass these around, yesterday someone said that they look like a giant rabbit pellets. And indeed, they actually do. They're, 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 quite, they're quite large. And, and I've coated them with, with glue. So there's one that's open and there's some that are closed. And as an entomologist, this is what I do in the winter. I got these out of my refrigerator. So uh, it looks kind of like a box of chocolates, too. And if you had married, <laughs> married an entomologist, you could get this for me for Valentine's Day. I would be a really cheap date. <laughs> and if you drop this and destroy them, you will be buying me real chocolates. So don't destroy them, because I had to work hard to get these. So this little chamber is under the ground. They make it with their spit, I think, and they kind of form this little chamber in, in the fall, and they use that to overwinter. So you can look in there. There's one that I kind of opened up, and then the rest of them are closed up, and that's how they're overwintering. Uh, then we get the moths coming out in June. Some of you trapped last year. I think Martin had traps with his students. And then we get the, uh, the egg masses. We've had these quite large egg masses, sometimes up to 100 eggs per mass, usually around 50 or 60. And then what we worry about, of course, are the larvae, which are two to three times the size of a European corn borer. They eat m many, many more kernels than a European corn borer. And uh, they only have one generation per year, unlike corn borer. So we, we're pretty much pounding corn borer by using BT corn, but we haven't solved this insect. Remember, this insect is not from China, like everything else I talk about. It's from the western US. And it has now moved from Nebraska and Colorado in the last 10 years. This year, it was found all the way on Long, on Long Island. So it has gone all the way across the US in about 10 years. And this is what we're worried about, the damage on corn. And any time you see this damage on the side of corn ears, it's always western bean cutworm. And I have two ears you can pass around. Uh, one of them has damage in the side. And the second one, I think guys are chewing on it as I pass it around. There's, it's progressively falling apart. But the second one you'll see has what I call cheese grater scraping, where they scrape away at the kernel when, when it gets really, really dry. And these are from Mont Montcalm County. So here's our peak of trap catch this year. It's June 25th. And for those of you in the back, during that peak, it's caught across Michigan in about 300 and some traps, almost 30,000 moths. And uh, if you look last year, which was a quite cool year, our peak for the people in the, who sat in the front, the good studious people, they could see the peak was actually August 8th. So we were two years ahead of schedule compared to last year. Who's dropping my corn up here? Oh, you're buying me chocolates. I like those little cherries that have the chocolate on the outside. You can some of those, I'll be good. You got, I can't trust you guys. I'm at least I'm keeping you awake. So on August 8th, we had our peak last year, and the peak was we were catching about 
10, 10,000 mods or so. So the first question people asked me was, well, are we at the end of the outbreak? Haven't you solved this yet? Like soybean aphid, aren't, aren't they gone? No, they're still flying around. We still have quite a few of them. And we really don't seem to be at the end of our outbreak, at least in 2010. And it is important to pay attention to that trapping network. Because if you were going to scout, last year you were looking at early August. This year we were looking at mid to late July. So there is a, there is a difference in time frame based on weather and de, um, de, 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 degree days. Uh, this is the trap catch by county. So depending on where you are in Michigan, some people really like to trap and we have many, many traps in some counties. Mont Montcalm County, for instance, if you saw that total, the total for Montcalm County was almost 17,000 moths. And that's because there was a trap on every corner, it seemed like. Martin, I don't know how many you had in this area, but fewer. There were, there were fewer in this area. So I'm showing you the, the average per trap. And where I've highlighted it in, in yellow, these are areas. This is my western bean cutworm black hole and has been for the last three years. Uh, Paul is from there. He probably brought some with him as he came here. Uh, and you know, so we have 500, 400 per, per trap. Nothing like what they found in the West during an outbreak, but, but for us, th these are fairly high numbers. This area has corn and dry beans. It has some areas with really sandy soil, and it seems to be uh, at, at risk. This area along the lake shore has historically, since 2006, had higher populations, especially the Traverse City area. And again, it's a sandy soil along that lake shore. Uh, again, I know I violated Michigan, state of Michigan law by not showing you all of the Upper Peninsula on a map. I know that that's part of the law now, but I'm showing you part of the Upper Peninsula, and that was where dry beans were produced, and they uh, sprayed all the dry beans in that area. And in southern Michigan, we had another hot spot, and if you looked over at Indiana, Indiana had really high trap catches too. Once you get over to this area in the thumb, this is my lowest area, and I had plots in the, uh, the new MSU farm near Reese this year, and uh, I didn't find any egg masses, uh, very, very low, low numbers. And I forgot what your trap catches were, Martin, but compared to areas to the west of you, uh, you seem to have less of a population here. So when we trap, we use a milk jug, and I take my smallest, shortest girl student, and I throw her into the recycle bin, and then they come out with these milk jugs, and we cut them up, and that's the kind that Martin had. Martin had a milk jug trap. They're free. I've uh, given people the, the little pheromone, the little attractant. We hang it right under the little milk jug cap, and the male moths fly at night to find females. That's when they mate. That's when they lay eggs. They fly at night. And uh, they find each other by smell, essentially. So the male comes into that trap, and we put antifreeze down at the bottom. And as they fly around inside that trap, he's looking to mate. And then he falls into the antifreeze, and he dies. And that trap is, is free. And that's uh, my average trap catch in the milk jug trap is in the black line here. The other kind of trap we tried this year is called a bucket trap. And it does not have anything in it. There's, there's no liquid in it. So it's really easy to use. And we hang the pheromone here. And the male moth kind of bops in. He falls into this little, there's a funnel inside there. And like most males, he has no sense of direction. And he won't ask for directions. <laughs> and he can't get out. So he is stuck in this trap. And then he dies. And it's really easy to use, but it's like 9 or $10 a piece. So if you're an avid trapper and you really, really want to trap, maybe Paul's from the middle of the state. Maybe I'll give him a bucket trap next year. But it is more expensive. You can use it year after year. But unless you're really serious about trapping, you're better off with just drinking a gallon of milk and support the dairy industry and make a milk jug trap. And, and we get the same trap catch, that's this green line, as we do with the milk jug trap. But, but we are probably, for our research, going to go to this bucket trap. This is my um, estimate of where I have seen larvae, I've seen damage, I've seen feeding, extension agents have re reported problems. 
And so any place in the yellow, in the darker yellow here, in corn, this is where we know we have western bean cutworms in some fields high enough to cause a problem. And in this lighter yellow, which may not show up for some of you, uh, oh, there's a big fly flying back. See, that's you. There's a lighter yellow here. Uh, this area, we have not really uh, seen many problems. And when you get to this white area in your area, I've never had a call about western bean cutworm that was confirmed, unless you guys tell me you've seen something. Has anyone here seen anything? One person, okay, in uh, corn, I presume. Okay, so it was in sweet corn, which doesn't surprise me because you often do a couple plantings of sweet corn and one of those ends up being attractive and in the, in the non-BT corn. So you get a prize, I don't know what that would be, uh, for maybe I'll give you one of those rabbit repellent things there. So we do have, I guess, maybe a little bit here, but for the most part, you guys have the lowest populations of western bean cutworm and the least damage. This area down here in southwest Michigan this year had more damage reported than, than what we've ever had. Some of that is people are actually walking fields to, to, to see, uh, but part of it is I think our populations were, were pretty high. So this is a typical egg mass. Here's a penny, so you can see the size. They average about 50 or 60 eggs per mass. And then they, when they hatch it, this is probably two to three days old. It's kind of tan colored. When the eggs develop fully after about five or six days, they turn purple or black. And that's because what you're seeing is the whole head of the insect. Essentially, the head is huge compared to the body. And those in the front can see the head is black. So when they hatch out, what you see in that egg mass is just head, essentially. And before this year, our egg hatch has been 99%, 100%. Uh, all eggs hatch. They're very, very successful. And once they hatch, the egg mass is empty and it looks kind of pearly white, or they eat their egg mass as a snack, and they just leave a little glistening circle. So this is when, when we scout for fields, we can sometimes find these where we know that the egg mass has actually hatched out. And up till from 2006 to 2009, egg hatch has been 100%. I mean, it, it was pretty scary to see every little guy coming out of that egg mass. Uh, none, none of these eggs seem to be dying until this year. This is the first time that we've seen a reduction in egg hatch down to about 80%. And that may not seem like a lot, but if 20 out of 100 eggs don't hatch, that's 20 fewer larvae out there to begin to attack things. And what we're seeing are, are a couple of different things. This egg mass here, the front part of it, or maybe it's the back part, has hatched and they've started to eat the egg mass. So those were successful. But the back part of this egg mass uh, never survived, it never hatched. It looks like those eggs weren't even fertilized. So let me tell you a little bit about how insects reproduce. Most insects are promiscuous. The female will mate, will come out and mate with a bunch of males. And the male gives his sperm to her in little packets, like little gift rack packets sort of. And when he puts it inside